Good morning slash afternoon, everybody. Uh, so today we're talking organic molecules. Um, this is unit four, topic two of the chemistry unit from the QCAA syllabus. So we're going to be going through a quick overview of all of the learning goals that are within this section of the syllabus so that you can then understand where you need to do further study. Um, so let's just get straight into it. Um, so chemical design and synthesis, kind of important. These are the three main categories. So we're talking chemical synthesis, so the creation of stuff, chemical, uh, green chemistry and molecular manufacturing, and lastly, macromolecules. So they're the main sorts of areas that this is going to be focusing on. So firstly, what is chemical synthesis? So in chemistry, chemical synthesis is the artificial execution of useful chemical reactions to attain one or several products. So it is a series of reactions that a chemist will go through to create their final product, whatever that may be. So sometimes it might just be a singular reaction. Um, so you might be looking to get C. So A plus B equals C, that's it, you're done. You've chemically synthesized something through one step. Other times you might want to get to G, but the only way to get that is to get C first, then use C plus D to get E, and then use U plus F to get G. Um, this is another example here. So if you're trying to make something much bigger and more complex like this, you might take multiple steps in multiple places, adding them together to create this giant molecule. Hopefully that made sense. Um, optimizing yield. So chemists work to optimize the yield of the reactants in order to maximize the product being produced while minimizing reactant waste. Very important. You don't want to be wasting reactants because reactants cost money. The process costs money. Any temperatures or um, pressures or anything like that, that costs money. So particularly in a situation like a business, uh, it's really important that you have high yields to get as much product as you possibly can out of the reactants that you have and the conditions that you're using. Um, so you can work out the percentage yield by taking the actual yield, so what you actually got, divide it by what you theoretically would have gotten if you just used basic theoretical data from the stoichiometry, and then multiply by 100% to get to the percentage part of the yield. Um, it talks about a couple of specific processes in the syllabus. So the first one is the Haber process or Haber process. I don't really know how to pronounce that, um, which is the com combination of nitrogen and hydrogen to create um, ammonia. So that is the Haber process. It is very important in industry because ammonia is used in a lot of fertilizers and there's a lot of farmers that use fertilizers that contain ammonia. So it is an important Reaction is used for a lot of different things, but it's also reversible. Being reversible, it means that if you do not have the right conditions, the reaction is going to happen in the reverse direction. So the problem with the Haber process is you have to maximize the forward reaction yield so that you don't have the ammonia turning back into the nitrogen and hydrogen and waste some of the products and time and all of that. So typically this is done by using ideal conditions um, which is really high pressures, high temperatures, um, and they use iron as a catalyst quite frequently. So nitrogen from the air and hydrogen from natural gas, most cases methane, is added together in a one to three ratio. Um, and then that is put through this high pressures, high temperature situation. Um, gases are cooled and ammonia turns into a liquid and the liquid is removed. The unreacted gases are recycled. So it goes through the process this will keep recycling, they'll keep adding things from here and hopefully get as much liquid ammonium as possible. And if you remember back to Le Chatelier's principle, if you are removing something from the system, say the liquid ammonia, it is going to be very helpful because that's going to force it to go towards the ammonia to try and make up for that loss. So by removing that ammonia straight away from the reaction, it is increasing the yield of the forward reaction. All right, next we have the contact process. So this is the production of sulfuric acid. It is a multiple step process. So the last one was just a singular step chemical synthesis. This is a multi-step chemical synthesis. So the first thing they do is take sulfur dioxide and, oh, actually the first thing they do, I guess, is make sulfur dioxide. The um, main reaction that we talk about though is going from sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide, which then goes through another step to eventually become the sulfuric acid. 
Again, these are at high temperatures. They do this at high temperatures. Um, they also have a catalyst, and this time it's vanadium oxide, but they don't have super high pressures in this one. It's a very um, normal pressure situation. And depending on which one of these that you're looking at, um, you could probably work out why they would do that. There's not a huge difference between the amount of gas particles in all of these. So adding pressure is not going to be hugely helpful. Um, whereas in this one, on this side, you have five different molecules of gas. And on this side, you have two. So there's a big difference. So adding a lot of pressure is going to help force it that way. Um, in this one, some of them have a little bit. So this is uh, one is to one gases. So that wouldn't help. Uh, this is three is to two. So it would help a little bit move towards this side but probably not enough to justify the cost of putting it under high pressure. Um, and then these, not so much, because they're gases and liquids. So that's the uh, contact process. So similar manner, it uses high temperatures and a catalyst. Uh, next, biodiesel. So biodiesel can be synth synthesized using a base catalyzed reaction or a lipase catalyzed reaction. So lipase being... Um, a fat enzyme. The reactions involved in the production of biodiesel and ethanol and hydrogen fuels include addition, oxidation, and esterification reactions. You should remember that from the last overview we do did. So addition is when you break a double bond and you add something on either side of those double bonds. Uh, oxidation is when something's losing an electron, or in this case, uh, it would be losing uh, H plus. No, gaining a H plus. Um, a serification is a carbon dioxide plus an alcohol becoming an ester. So this is another pretty complex situation. So you can start most of the time. It starts with vegetable fats and animal oils, um, and it can be go through multiple different processes, um, including esterification, which is then separated into things. Then you can recover the alcohol through multiple processes, which then helps in the esterification. So there's multiple loops that this can go through depending on exactly how much of something you're trying to get and what exactly you're trying to use. But for the most part, you end up with water as a byproduct, biodiesel as a secondary byproduct, and glycerol, which can be used for soap as a third byproduct. All right, uh, enzymes. We also talked about this, this in the last one as well. Uh, enzymes are biological catalysts. They speed up a reaction, but there's a specific enzyme for each specific reaction that happens in the body. So they're used on an industrial scale to improve the rates of their reactions. Um, and some people think it's more natural because it's something that you find in the human body, but I don't know about that one. Uh, these things include the fermentation of ethanol and the transesterification of biodiesel. So we've got things in like dairy production, lactase, catalases, proteases that help with the production of milk and cheese and cream and all of that. Brewing, this is making your like beers and, and stuff like that. We use different types of enzymes in those as well. Um, in baking, particularly to make things rise, that happens. Um, making wine and fruit juice uses other enzymes and Breaking down meats uses other enzymes. So lots of different enzymes are used in different industries for different purposes. All right, main one that we're going to talk about is ethanol production. Um, so ethanol can be produced in two ways. The first one is ethanol fermentation from sugars. And the second one is ethene hydration. I know for a fact that this was on the 2020 external exam. There was a question that talked about um, the production of fermentation and which was the greener of the two um, and which one was better for the environment and lots of stuff like that so you needed to have this knowledge about this so the first one you start with starch it's broken down by enzymes into glucose sugars uh, which is then broken further down by enzymes into ethanol and co2 so you'll notice straight away we have one molecule of glucose to start with we end up with two molecules of ethanol and two molecules of CO2. That means that this, in terms of atom economy, this reaction is about 50% atom economy percentage. Uh, that doesn't make much sense, but so only 50% of the, 
of this is what we want. The other 50% is CO2. Not 100% because it's based on weight, but approximately. Uh, so that, if you were talking about atom economy, the amount of the product that you want that you were getting out of the reaction by percentage base, the, f product, the fermentation of ethanol was not great. However, if you are looking at, in terms of the um, environmental use or uh, the cost, you'd then be thinking about the fact that going from ethene to ethanol, even though that reaction is 100% atom economy wise, so all of the ethene becomes ethanol, it uses temperatures that are high, pressures that are high, and a catalyst. So you have to keep in mind that these conditions, even though you're getting 100% of the product you're getting is what you want, it's using a high temperature, a high pressure, and a catalyst that's going to cost money and probably not be great for the environment as a total, if you look at the whole thing. Um, yeah, hydration occurs in presence of phosphoric acid at relatively low industry-wise temperatures, 300 degrees, and pressure. So that's some information about that. If you were wondering why that question was answered the way it was on that 2020 exam, um, that would be why. Transesterification is the process of exchanging the organic R group of an ester with the organic R group of an alcohol. These reactions are often catalyzed by the addition of an acid or a base. So esterification just in general is when you create an ester out of a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. Transesterification is when you're exchanging something from an ester with something from an alcohol. So you're not creating a new ester, the ester already exists, you're just swapping out an R group for a different R group. So that's in the case of uh, saponification triglycerides. We've already got the, the ester already exists. What we're doing is we're replacing this triglyceride here with a different fatty acid. So we're just replacing one of the arms on the ester, essentially, is that what we're doing. Um, okay, hydrogen fuel cells can happen in acidic or basic conditions. So we've got um, just some examples here. Hydrogen H2 going in, water going out um, at the anode and at the cathode. cathode you've got oxygen coming in um, and going out again because the oxygen is going to be used. So it carries over the electrite to be used over here in this reaction to produce the water. So it's um, hydrogen gas is going in, oxygen gas is going in, um, the oxygen is reacting um, at the cathode, the O negative 2 minus is traveling through the electrode and comes out and reacts to create water that leaves at the anode. So that's in acidic conditions. And then this one is just showing the same thing. But in this case, we're talking um, the hydrogen's coming in, the hydrogen's moving over the membrane and then interacting with the oxygen to produce water on this side. So that's the main difference. One of them is um, having oxygen going over and the other one's having hydrogen going over. Um, percentage yield calculations. We did talk about this just before, but um, here's an example. So uh, the calculations require the actual mass produced in the reaction and the expected mass of the reaction. So if in a question you are given the number of moles of a reactant and your mass of your product, you're pretty much guaranteed that you are going to have to work out the percentage yield. So the way we do that, um, you take the masses that you know. Anything that you can possibly get the number of moles for from that information, you'll do that. Um, and then you are going to get the moles of expected products using your stoichiometry values. And then from there, you're going to get the mass of your expected, which in this case is 22.5. Your actual mass that you actually got was 19.8 grams. So that is your top mark. Your mass of water that you expected is the bottom of the theoretical. Multiplied by 100, the percentage yield was 88%. Does that make sense? So you're given the mass of your start product and the mass of the end product. You then have to find out theoretically from this 10 grams, how much H2O should I have gotten if everything reacted, which is your 22.5. And then 19.8 divided by 22.5 gives you your percentage yield. Uh, it is also important to understand what limiting reagents are if you have forgotten. So in order for you to be able to find the theoretical yield, you need to know 
which is the limiting reagent because that is the number of moles you need to use for your stoichiometry. Um, so if you really don't know or don't remember or have forgotten, uh, limiting reagent is the thing that's going to be used up first in your reaction. So if I have five hot dogs and four hot dog buns, how many hot dogs in a bun am I going to be able to make? Four. And I'm going to have one leftover hot dog. So in this case, the limiting reagent is the bun. So once I've run out of buns, I can't keep making hot dogs. That's it. So that's the exact same thing with a chemical reaction. If we replace these with our chemicals, this chemical is going to run out before this chemical is going to run out. So when this is done, the full amount of this is used up, there's still going to be some excess left of the other chemical. I hope that makes sense. All right, green chemistry. There is a lot of different sections in green chemistry, uh, 12 to be exact. The main concept of green chemistry is trying to increase the production of the products while decreasing the reactant waste and keeping harmful solutions out of the equation. So it's not necessarily only doing things that are going to be amazing for the environment, but it's taking a look at all of the possible things that you could do for this reaction and picking the one that is going to be less harmful and the most efficient. So we've got things, we've got um, waste prevention, so making sure that you're not going to produce a lot of wastes. Atom economy, so at a molecular level reducing waste, so you want ideally 100% of the products you make to be what you're looking for. So if you are trying to make um, methane, you want the only product that comes out of your reaction to be methane. If you've got, say, methane plus water, then you're losing some efficiency in your reaction because you're not using all your model uh, molecules effectively. Uh, less hazardous chemical synthesis, so is trying to reduce the amount of hazard coming from all of the substances during the reaction, including the waste, so the products, the reactants, and all of the waste products, um, trying to make them as less hazardous as possible. Uh, designing safer chemicals to use, so again, things that don't have as high of a toxicity or um, environmental negativeness. Then we got safer solvents and auxiliaries, so choosing the safe, safest things for each step. So if you've got an option of two, whichever one is going to be safest for the person using it and other people in the vicinity and the environment. Designing for energy efficiency. If we can lower the amount of energy we need to get the reaction happening, um, including things like avoid heating and cooling it and pressurizing it, then that is going to be best to do that. So if we don't need to add extra pressure because it's not going to give that much of a result, then we don't do that. Uh, use of renewable food stocks. So chemicals made from renewable things like plant-based sources rather than um, non-renewable sources like coal and stuff like that. Reducing derivatives. So um, temporary derivatives such as protecting groups are things that happen in the reaction step, the intermediary step to get to what you want. So reducing those because that requires resources and creates waste. Um, catalysts. Use catalysts instead of stoichiometry reagents in reactions. So trying to use as many catalysts to increase the selectivity and minimize the waste. So again, remembering we're trying to minimize waste, maximize product. And also increasing the speed is quite helpful. Um, design waste products that can degrade easily or are safe to be discarded. Um... Keep an eye on the pollution prevention and monitor the chemical reactions to make sure that there's not much pollution happening and also safer chemistry for accident prevention. So minimizing the risks and knowing the risks before you start on something. All right, atom economy. Um, this one here, we actually do have a percentage calculation. So percentage atom economy. So the molar mass of the product divided by the molar mass of all of the reactants. So if there is only one product, you will end up with 100%. If there is two products like my example here, you're not going to end up with 100% because you have a secondary product that is not going to be included in the calculation. So in the molar mass of the product, that is only talking about the product that you actually want to be creating. So in this case, they're trying to produce water. So the product they want to be creating is the water. Um, so they do the molar mass of the product, which is um, 18, 
times 2 because there's 2 in the stoichiometry value, so 36. Um, and then oxygen times 2 is 64 and CH4 is 16. So if you add those together, you get 80 plus the 36 for the re required product. So 36 divided by 80 times 100 gives you your atom economy and it's 45%. So it's 45% efficient in terms of atom economy, which is not great. If there was an alternative reaction, which in this case there is using hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, the only thing produced in that reaction is water. So the atom economy of that would be 100%. So in terms of atom economy, that would be more efficient than this reaction here. However, that reaction might use a lot of temperature, a lot of pressure, a lot of catalysts, and could therefore not be the best option. So you have to look at all different sides and you need to put all of the things against each other and work out what is the best option for all of these things. So you should make sure you give yourself a go at determining the atom economy of reactions. Easiest way to do that, Google search chemical reaction, go to the images, you'll find a bunch of random chemical reactions and then work out the atom economy of them, which one's the most efficient that you can find. Things like that. Okay, next we have molecular manufacturing. So molecular manufacturing involves the positioning of individual molecules to synthesize specialist products such as proteins, carbon nanotubes, and chemical sensors. This is a very big area of growth in the chemistry industry. Lots of cool things have been coming out of molecular manufacturing because any molecule that is manufactured this way is going to be tiny. So these sorts of things that you can make using molecular manufacturing are super cool and super small. So if you can get a molecule, if you can manufacture a molecule that can do something really cool, like um, a molecule that can eat oil off of seawater, those things are going to be great if we can get them to do do it properly um, even things like artificially manufacturing um, the insulin producing cells for people that get diabetes too like there's so many different areas that this could go into but it's such a new science that we don't have a lot of information on this yet but it is going to be really cool to watch how this goes in the future um, so uh, this is just an example you've got this kind of ball and ring model that just moves across and you put the particular atoms that you want in the places that you want and you end up with your strand of something. So in this case, um, this is the main ring here. Um, this red thing is that, this is that, so on and so forth. So you've got your main strand, the things that's connecting it, and then these are getting added on as it goes to produce a molecule. All right, and the last thing we need to talk about for this section is polymerization. You should already know what an addition reaction is. Addition polymerization is just this addition reaction happening over a long chain where everything is being added together. So most common cases, um, ethene is a very good example. So if you don't remember, an addition reaction is where you chop the double bond in half and attach something to either end of the broken double bond. So in this case, it'd be a hydrogen and a hydrogen. So when that happens, in addition to polymerization, you chop the double bond in half and the broken part of the double bond will attach to another of the exact same thing. So another ethene. So you'll end up with a long chain of ethenes that have had the double bond chopped that are connected together that we call polyethene. So technically these molecules are now alkane, so it'll be ethane, but because it started on ethene when it created the chain, we still call it polyethene. So essentially we chop this in half and it attaches to another version of itself that's been chopped in half and it will just grow and grow and grow, creating long chains. So the ones that are specifically mentioned, ethene to polyethene, propene to polypropene. Um, so this is the molecule here. This double bond breaks and will attach on either end and then you get one group, one methyl group coming off the edge. If you remember back to the last overview video, that methyl group can be in a different couple of different configurations. It can be atactic, which means just randomly on the top of the bottom. It can be syndiotactic, which means in a syn synchronized pattern. So up, down, up, down, up, down, highly regulated. 
or it can all be on the bottom or all be on the top. So that is... Why can I not remember the other one? Isotactic. So if it's on the all on the same side, it's isotactic. If it's in a pattern, it's syndiotactic. If it's random, it's actactic. Um, so yeah, polypropane is that one. And then the next one, tetrafluoroethylene, polytetrafluoroethylene, which is um, foam, polystyrene. Um, next is condensation polymerization. So this is a condensation reaction which involves the production of water as well as a polymer. These work a little bit differently than um, the addition reactions that we were looking at. So it create is created from um, an oic acid, so carboxylic acid and an alcohol. You'll notice that all of these have carboxylic acids on both ends or alcohols on both ends. Very important in order for the reaction to keep occurring. So the first thing that's gonna happen is these two are gonna combine together and in the process lose a H2O. So this O is gonna attach where this O was over here. Because you've now got an OH on the end here and, an double o, um, and an OH on the end over here as well, when you go through the next stage, you've got this, you'll have a bunch of these in the molecule. But they can then react with something else on the other side to create another ester and lose more water. So it creates a long chain in multiple steps of first it will create this, and then it will go through the exact same process again to create another section of the chain. So it'll be looped in, you'll find one of these, and then you'll find another one of the exact same, so on and so forth. Uh, so you'll always get the production of water and then a polymer as well. So condensation polymers include polypeptides, which are proteins, polysaccharides, which are carbohydrates, and polyesters. They're all produced from the original monomers, which in this case is hexandoic acid and ethendiol. All right, um, polymer use. Advantages. Uh, polymers usually have high strength because the chain length increases the strength and you can make really long chains of things with this. Uh, the density of polymers can vary greatly. So uh, you can have really strong, dense plastics and polymers or you can have uh, things like paper bags. Not paper bags, plastic bags that are not as dense and therefore are a lot more flexible. Um, and they don't react very easily. It's not easy to get a polymer to react with something else without putting it under extremely high pressures and temperatures and stuff like that. Um, disadvantages uses natural resources. So most of them are created from non-renewable resources at the moment. Um, and they do not biodegrade. They, Like I said, they've got lack of reactivity, which means that they're not going to easily react to break down. All right, and the last thing we need to talk about is amino acids and carbohydrates. So firstly, amino acids, they combine to form the proteins in a condensation reaction. So you've got two amino acids. The common things with amino acids, all of them have an NH2 group on one side and a carboxylic acid group on the other side. So to create this long carbon chain, the C double O bond the C double OH bond is going to react with the NH bond on another amino acid. That is going to be creating the amino bond between them and then water as well. And then the same thing is going to happen with the next structure to create this long chain as it goes through. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, carboxylic, uh, sorry, carbohydrates do the same thing. So disaccharides are formed when two monosaccharides are combined in a condensation reaction. So we've got here our two bonds and they are going to combine losing a H from one side and an OH from the other to produce this single O bond from either side. So the two OHs are going to bond together, lose a water and you end up with a glycosidic bond. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and this happens with the first carbon and the fourth carbon. So carbon number one and carbon number four. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's it for this. Um, that's covering most of, if not all of the things that are in topic two of organic molecules. Hopefully that made sense to you. I think possibly this section is maybe the easiest one to understand. I said the organic reactions is probably the hardest. This one's probably the easiest um, 
maybe equilibrium. But if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. Um, let me know. Uh, I really appreciate questions. It gives me an idea of what type of things you need to know that you don't already know. So I hope that makes sense and I uh, hope you enjoy and I shall see you in the next video. Bye.